Ana, you know, when we just look at the word uh, celebrate, and then linked with that word celebrate is like celebrities. And what does that word celebrate mean? That word celebrate, biblically, scripturally, meaning is to honor and when connected with like a holiday or a holy day, it's connected with honoring God, honoring the true source of life and peace and truth and happiness, you know. Um, but in, in the world, in, in Babylon, Babylon has taken these spiritual, um, this is what's mystery Babylon is, it's, it's a um, counterfeit religion or counterfeit spirituality or counterfeit thoughts of God and God related. It's really Satan pretending to be a God or transforming himself. You see, so what he's done is transform the language too. And when we look at the words that we use, we can see that, um, we can see clearly that transformation going on, such as the word celebrate. So what I've thought to do was in communication with some of the brothers and sisters is ask them, you know, are you going to celebrate, are you going to celebrate um, Fasica or to make it a little more specific, Fasica is still the Old Testament word that uh, Pesach, Passover, you know, so-called Jewish Judaic ideas, but taking that veil off our, our eyes like the, like the epistles and, and like the, the Adis Kidan, the New Testament says, as Paul says, um, because they've been blinded by the God of this world. I think that's um, first, uh, is that Corinthians? That's Corinthians 4 and 4. So what we wanted to do, seeing that today's Wednesday, you know, today is, today is the Wednesday of the so-called Passion Week. Um, Sunday, it's interesting because Sunday was April Fool's Day you know, in the West, and, and Sunday, 2012, April, was um, Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday, you know, the symbol of the palm is very deep, too, you know, don't have the opportunity to really go into the depth right now, but, you know, of course, that is going to the, the ancient symbolism, and, you know, we love Gerald Macy's works on in that regard, when we diligently compare it with the scriptures and with the Ethiopic, the Royal Amharic, um, the Masoretic Hebrew, and um, even the Greek, you know, the Greek uh, um, Septuagint. But in Corinthians, Exodus Corinthians, uh, it's Corinthians 2, right? It's Corinthians 2, which tells us about, uh, um, you know, the God of, the God of this world. So the God of this world, it says, but if our gospel, our wengel, our, our misraj, abisraj, Hebraically, but then in the, the koine or the Greek, that is wengel, or in the Greek is uen, u, e, u, gel, or gelion, u, e, u, 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 means good. And gilion or gelion means news. But of course, that's properly understood. That's a that's an Old Testament idea. That's a Hebraic idea. Um, but if our gospel, the gospel of the King of Kings and His Christ, be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, not the true God, but this one is a God, is the God of this world, hath blinded the minds of them which believe which uh, believe not, it says right here, which don't amen, or don't have amen, objective or subjective uh, faith, for lack of a better English word, least the light of, or the light, the illumination, the true Illuminati is the black Christ, of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image, um, Hebrews say the express image of God, should shine to them. For we preach or proclaim not ourselves, not I and I ourselves, but Christos Jesus, the Lord, or Adoni, the Adoni, and ourselves, your servants, for Joshua's sake, for Yeshua's, for Jesus' sake. 
for God who commanded the light, the illumination to shine out of darkness, have shined in our heart to give the light or the illumination of the knowledge. And knowledge, that word knowledge is gnosis in the, in, in the, in the um, Septuagint, the coin in Greek. So, you know, you hear all these people, so-called pseudo-Christians, talking about the Gnostics, the Gnostics, this, blah, 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 so on and so on, and they make you think, they make the um, illiterate Christians or the, the so-called laity think that you're supposed to be against, don't listen to anything Gnostic, all of them are bad, boogeymen, so forth and so on. Listen to us. You know, so they, they're really the ones who the Bible says who have transformed themselves, you know, who have transformed themselves um, to be uh, uh, angels or ministers of righteousness. So we see all these ones with their counterfeit um, Eurocentric whitewashed Christian traditions, you know, everything from like, for example, right now, this is, they, they call it Easter is coming up, Easter, Ishtar. You understand? But it has nothing to do, the real truth of it has nothing to do with, with, with Ishtar. You understand? When you really overstand, you know, but, um, First, per people have to get a good understanding, and a good understanding of the word knowledge is knowledge is gnosis, gnosis, the root of that word gnostic. So the illumination of the gnosis of the glory, the sekina, the shekina, the shakinah of ha Elohim in the face, in the panim, in the face of Jesus Christos. But most people have not seen the true face of Jesus Christos, because they've, get in, they've got in the, the image of the beast, or the antichrist image, you see what I'm saying, the whitewashed, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, or Kaiser, Caesar, Borgia image, but this is all very important when you put it into the proper context, but just to go to the chapter before is really what we're talking about as a lead intro into this, so when we speak about celebrating, you know, to celebrate, um, our our black lord's um evening meal the the passover what's known old testament as passover but what has has been fulfilled or perfected as the the master's evening meal or as the lord's supper they call it the lord's supper or adonis supper it's very important for us to understand that connection with that this is why we've done so many videos and, and teachings on this particular subject matter, especially in 2012. You understand? But that's what we've pointed out that um, Palm Sunday was, was, was what April, April 1st, and April 1st is known as April Fool's Day. And then when you understand the particular time that um, coming into Jerusalem and the palms, all of that goes back to ancient symbolism that is properly understood in the true Christ from an Afro-Shemitic, or we can say even the ancient Egyptian, the ancient Egyptian perspective, you know, because remember they came out of, they came out of Egypt, but the root of that is Ethiopia. But let's just go to this right here, and we'll get into this particular, um, um, uh, we want to touch on the Hebrew and the Amharic blessing for, for the, the bread and the wine, the blessing of the, of the bread and the wine and the lamb's bread. Also the lamb's bread is very important for us to, you know, um, to expose this cannabis matrix. You, you understand? And to put cannabis, once again, into its proper scriptural context and to deal with some of coming after or to see, yeah, I will, and to deal with some of the other kind of questions. Like, you know, cannabis doesn't have the same effect on everyone, you know? Um, some partake of it, and it's very spiritual. Others partake of it, and they're, you know, they've they become paranoid. They're insecure, you know, smoking marijuana. Some smoke marijuana and become very spiritual, become very, you know, tuned with true things. You know what I'm saying? And even in, and especially in the way of Christ, you know, find that it is part of the true way of Christ. But some in smoking um, or in partaking of the lamb's bread, it, it, it creates a different, a different psychological or soul response. And there's some very important reasons um, connected with that. But the chapter before, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it speaks about the ministry. It says, this is the subscription, the ministry is spiritual 
and glory is not legal or we could say legalistic. But we live in a world today, the present world today, is a world of laws, of man-made laws, you understand, know of the God of this world's law. And what they have exiled is God's way. Even though in blasphemy they use the Bible and they'll swear on the Bible or use Bible in their courts and they'll talk about their um, counterfeit, you understand, misinterpretation, Gentile, white, Western misinterpretation of our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMoshiach. And they'll wonder why the world is going to hell proverbially in a handbasket. You know what I mean? Maybe it's a little Red Riding Hood on the same level as the bunny rabbit, the Easter egg, Santa Claus, all of these false gods. And you'll say, well, it's just for the kids. It's just for the children. You're corrupting your children. You know, you are creating um, mindless drones for the so-called matrix. You understand for the so-called the Babylon's matrix. Because matrix means a womb. Let's, let's keep that in mind. Matrix means the womb. But there are two mothers. You understand? There is Babylon, who is a mother, you understand, and her mother fuckers, you understand? And then there is New Jerusalem, or the, the, the true church of God in Christ, the so-called Gnostic church, the real Noahs, who follow faithfully what the Master, our black Lord, said, ye shall know the truth, have gnosis of the truth, not of traditions, you understand? All these traditions is what's really holding a lot of ones within this world system, within this box, spiritually speaking. And um, this is why the day is coming on them like a thief in the night. You know what I mean? Judgment is coming on them as a thief in the night. But here in chapter, chapter 3, Second Corinthians, from verse 6, it says, um, who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, the Adis Kidan, not of the letter, not of the fidel, but of the menses of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. You know what I mean? The letter, you know, and we've been talking on our mother tongue, on the Hebrew, and of course on the Ethiopic, the Royal Amharic, the Metaph Kedus, you know what I'm saying? But you see, the letter itself, without that overstanding, but the overstanding is spiritual. You know what I'm saying? The overstanding is spiritual. The letter by itself, it, 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 it killeth. You know what I mean? Take some, you start talking about hieroglyphics, explaining the Bible to some so-called nominal Christians. You know what I'm saying? It killeth, it, it killeth them because they don't have the spirit. It's the spirit that giveth life. But it's the ministration of death, written and engraved in stones. That's the hieroglyph. You understand, that's, that's the, the, in stone writing, was glorious. But that was glorious. But it was a ministration of death because death reigned from Adam, from Atum, to Moshe. You understand, to Tehut Musa, Yovis. And it says, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face. Once again, we're speaking about face. What's important about the word face? Some would say, well, the face basically means the presence. Yeah, we get that, but why is the word face significant? You see, you have to go to the, the, the root of the mysteries that Moses, our lawgiver, was acquainted with and was mighty in what word and deed, the, the wisdom, you understand, of the Egypts. Behold the face of Musa, you understand, for the glory of his countenance, for the glory of his countenance, which... Glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? So we have two kind of ministrations. There was one ministration. Now notice the bread and the wine. Notice something about the bread and the bread and the wine are fulfilling the the old ministration, really fulfilling the ministration of death. You know what I'm saying? And even Christ said that he would not partake of it until he partake of the fruit. You understand? The fruit of the vine or the fruit new or renewed in his father's kingdom. And then when he appeared in the midst of them and said, Salam le non to you, whom peace be to you all, what did he do? He breathed on them. He showed them his hands and he showed them his side to say, yes, I am he. 
In other words, yes, you're looking at one who has overcome death. You understand? Imagine, you know, I mean, just I mean, just think about that for a moment. You know, it's like that's what they hold. That's what the God of this world holds over everyone is death. So what our Black Lord and Savior basically did was was he 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 overcame the the systemic anomaly. You understand? He overcame that, and now he's demonstrating. The Imare, he's demonstrating to his to his disciples and to the apostles he's sending out. He's demonstrating to them that this overcoming of that old paradigm is real. You understand? Is real. So he breathes on them and says, "Receive." Men says, "Kedus in You understand? Receive Kabbalah, the Holy Spirit. In other words, Kabbalah is is for those some. You know, like forever learning but never able to come to acknowledgement of the truth, that they know these things. You know, it's like um, one getting these diplomas but still remaining in spiritual intellectual comas. You know, so they go to school, they're exposed to all this information, but they don't understand it. They don't, you know, they don't even understand. It's interesting, a lot of folks have gone to college, study economics, so forth and so on, go on the YouTubes or something like that on the Internet and begin to really learn about debt and the dollar and so forth and so on. And none of this, really, they were taught when they spent thousands of dollars in school. You know what I'm saying? Just to give one you just give one example, one example of it. But it says, for us, the ministration of condemnation be glory. Much more doth the ministration of righteousness. And we're speaking about remember, righteous, Siddiq, Malkad, Siddiq, Melchizedek, exceed in glory, exceeds in the, in the Shekinah, in the Sekinah, in the shock and awe. For even that which was made glorious, had no glory. Even that which was made glorious, it really did have no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. It really had no glory. That which was made glorious didn't have a glory by the glory that really excelled that particular glory. For if that which is done away was glorious, if that which was done away with had a glory and was glorious, check this out. It says, much more that which remaineth, that which remaineth is glorious. You know, when we teach about um, Matthew chapter 24, and we're in that time, you know, the, this had a hurricane, actually not hurricane, tornado. They've been having hurricanes too, but they had this tornado out there. And some of y'all probably would have already checked out some of the clips or heard about it where, where they said um, something very unusual, these tornadoes, there was like some say 12 or so you know, of these tornadoes that touched down and kind of like stayed on the ground in, in, in the Texas area for like half an hour. They said usually a tornado, you know, it touches down for a moment or so. And we were checking out what the CBS, we've seen the BS, right? So we checked out like CBS, uh, the afternoon, evening news, and, and it was talking about the weatherman or whatever like that, was talking about... Um, like, yeah, he said these were some, some terrific. It might have actually been a real, real record the first time talking about the E3, the E4, and all these kind of, um, you know, scientific uh, categorization, so forth and so on. But then he said something interesting. He said there must have been a beast. This is at least what I heard. He said there must have been like a beast in, in, in the storm. So I'm just thinking about these beasts right here. You know, I was thinking about these beasts. And we didn't even get to the point of explaining how these beasts right here that we see in the five um, acceptable beasts of sacrifice in the Old Testament, and we're studying how now Christos, Yeshua, our Black Lord and Savior, how he fulfills these varied aspects in his one, in his one um, sacrifice, and that's the reason, that's the real reason for the so-called, falsely so-called Easter season. You know what I'm saying? That's the real reason. But people are being so misled by the God of this world, whom the God of this world has what blinded their minds, you know what I'm saying, least unless the light, the Barahana Salam of the glorious gospel of Christ, even Christ in its kingly character, who is the image of God, should shine, should illuminate on them. You know what I'm saying? Should illuminate. So there's a reason why some folks don't get it. This is what the Bible is saying here in Second Corinthians chapter four verse 4, who, who, who just don't get the revelation of Rastafari fulfilling, you know what I'm saying, the prophecies which are here in the scripture and completing 
You understand? It began from Ethiopia in the beginning. You understand? And it returns to Ethiopia, we could say to Africa. It began from the black and it returns to the black, about the fade to black. All right? So right here it's saying, seeing then that which, seeing then that we have such hope. We have such hope. What is hope? Hope is expectation. Tesfa. Tesfa is expectation. We have expectation. Those who are lost, who Babylon has blinded, they don't have no expectations because it's all caught up in the world and all these illusions are crashing down, are crashing down. They're going to have to turn to the B-I-B-L-E, the Bible, in faith and, and, and through our black Lord and Savior, through faith in Christ. You know what I'm saying? The Amen. You know what I'm saying? If they're going to get any hope because they are totally hopeless. Seeing then we have such hope. We use great plainness of speech. We use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a what veil over his face. Now, this is the part about the veil we wanted you to get. You know what I'm saying? We went over it before, but it's important to really, you know, because even though we read this maybe about like 10 years ago, and we got a basic kindergarten level of, you know, overstanding, even the first time you really get something like, yeah. But as you continue to... Uh, um, learn, you understand, study and learn and grow. It's very important. You know, it's, 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 the, the scripture is very important to study. You understand, even the book of Eli, that movie, one of Denzel Washington's best movie, if, if, if the Grammys and the Academy Awards was real, was about something real, was really about Sita and not Oscar, you understand, then they would have given that particular movie you know, saying an Oscar for, you know, or Oscar to Denzel Washington in the book of Eli. But the book of Eli, basically, you know what the book was? You understand the book that they needed after the, after the annihilations, after the catastrophes, after the catabol, after the destruction, after this whole world system has been thrown down, fulfilling what Daniel even saw and spoke of in prophecy and what Revelation speaks of. What did they need? They needed the Bible. You understand? They need it. You know, you know, so one can say, as they say, you know, they're telling you, you know, look, they're telling you even in that movie, they're telling you right there. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of this Israel could not look steadfastly to the end of that which is abolished. They could not see straightly to the end, to the fulfillment of that which is abolished. So when we're talking about Leviticus and these Levitical offerings, it's very, it's very important for us to understand that these, you know, you understand that these are to be abolished and these have been abolished. But we have to study to show ourselves approved to God as workmen, because there's work to be done. There's a lot of ones who claim to be his daughters and sons, but there's still much work to be done but they have to study and show themselves approved. So this is what we're doing in communicating this teaching, you know, to help strengthen our brothers and sisters. Now, it says that um, Moses, you know, not, at Mo not, at, not, not like Musa, Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel, the, the Degik Israel or the Bani Israel, could not look steadfastly um, to the end, to the fulfillment of that which is abolished, but their minds... Get this, their minds were blinded. Their minds were blinded. Not their eyes. They were seeing, you understand, you know, like they said, eyes wide shut, you know. They're, they're like in eyes wide shut. They're, they're seeing, but they really don't see. They really don't get it, you know what I mean, after thousands of videos and, and other kind of movies, documentaries, people saying it here, they, they still they don't get it. Why they don't get it? It says, but their minds were blinded because the God of this world is blind. You see, the God of this world blinds, the God of the world makes his followers just like himself. So wants to blind you to the truth of this and the veritas of this. But their minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away. So even as Moses had that veil, symbolically speaking, Huadi Apollos is saying that the same veil still remains untaken away in the reading in the Torah reading, we can say, but the reading of the Old Testament. So when they read the Old Testament, they're blinded to That's why they run away from Torah. You understand? They run away from that study. I'm talking about the regular churches, the so-called Christian folk. 
you understand, and especially the black Christian folk, because what happened? Their minds were blind as well. Until this day, remain at the same veil I'm taking away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ, even Christ and his kingly characters. They read the Old Testament, they don't recognize talking about the lost sheep, they don't recognize that when they're reading the, the Old Testament, black Christians and so-called, so forth, whatever they want to call themselves, but, you know, a lot of the black so-called, you know, churchians and Christians, they don't recognize that when they're reading about the people in the Old Testament and the prophecies in the Old Testament, they're reading about themselves. You understand? They, themselves, their ancestors and their posterity. They don't recognize that they're reading about themselves. And the, the preachers and the pastors, because they've apostated themselves and gone after Balaam, Balaam, you know, saying, and Jezebel up there in the black churches, because they've gone that particular way, you understand? Know, they don't recognize so the veil is not taken away in the reading of the Old Testament, but this veil is done away with in Christ. So as it was for the Son, for Yeshua HaMoshiach, for Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ, so it is for the King of Kings, for Kedemawi Haile Selassie. In this time with the people, Revelation says, who will have the new name. You know what I'm saying? He says, I will have a new name. Yes, there is, there is respect for the name of Yeshua, but even Yeshua says in Revelation that way, he says, I will have a new name. You see what I'm saying? So we, we, have to, we have to recognize that. You know what I'm saying? But he came as a thief in the night. They didn't recognize it. But even to this day, when Moses is read, when they read Moses, the veil is upon their hearts. This is why we spent so much time to teach even this particular portion of the Torah as it connects with the, the, the Pesach and, and, and Fasica and Passover. And, 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 and the sacrifice of Christ to explain the real inner gnosis, you know what I'm saying, the, the, the knowledge of this. How does it apply, you know what I'm saying, in hopes that ones, that, 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 that veil which is over their eyes and over many ones and one's eyes would be lifted away and taken away through our preaching, not ourselves, not I and I, not Rasi Adinos, not, no, but preaching the King of Kings, and his Christ, and the true Christ, our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua, Yeshua HaMoshia. So let's just get through this right here. So it says, um, it says, the veil is upon their hearts. The veil is upon their hearts. Nevertheless, when it shall turn, you know what I'm saying? Nevertheless, when their hearts still shall turn. So even there we're seeing in the epistle here in Second Corinthians, there's still hope for the so-called lost black sheep. There, there's still hope because it says that, that when they read it, there's a veil over their hearts. But nevertheless, when it shall turn to Adoni, you know what I'm saying? When it, what's the it? When their hearts shall turn. Now, you know, I was thinking about this like, wow, so... You mean all of a sudden they're going to be doing what they're doing, then all of a sudden, like, they're going to put down the golden calf worship and then turn to Adoni, then turn to the king of kings? No, it's, it's the things in time. You understand? It's the experience that really teaches us. It's through the experience that we really gain wisdom. We might have a little bit of knowledge, but we need that experience, you understand, that really, to, to know the truth in that sense. Um, he who feels it in the words knows it in that sense. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to Adoni, to the true black Lord, our black Lord and Savior, the veil, the veil shall be taken away. You know, so it reminds me like the, the so-called Victorian um, wedding and marriage ritual, right, where the woman in the Victorian, the white Western tradition of marriage has a veil over her face. And then when after the vows are exchanged, you understand, after the covenant is made, the Kalakidan, then the man or the male turns to the female who has a, who has a veil over her face, and then he lifts up that particular veil, and he kisses, he says, like, you know, you may kiss the bride, so forth and so on, and he kisses the bride. Just as an example that might be able to um, um, explain as a parable in a sense, you know, what is being said here vis-a-vis -vis those whom it is, it is for. It says, now Adoni, Adoni is, Adonai is that spirit, is that manifest, is that ruach. And where the Ruach, the spirit of Adoni, of the Lord is, there is what? There is liberty. So that means wherever the spirit of Adoni, you understand, of, of um, Atum, 
you understand, of the master is not, there is bondage. So once again, explain that spiritual Egypt, where we're at now, and based on the template, you understand, of where we were then. Because he said in the latter days, a lot of these things that were cryptic, that people didn't understand what it meant, why was it put in the Bible, and that sounds crazy. Now they're beginning to see the reality of that, and I, and I say hallelujah, you know, hallelujah for it. So the last verse, verse 18, it says, but we all with open face, mm. That means you can have closed, if you have open face, you have closed face. But now it says, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass. You know, they have this, the, the movie out there. Some of you might have seen it, the mirror, mirror on the wall, blah, blah, blah. You know, but the whole thing about the mirror. But here it's saying a glass, right? So check this out. But we all with open face beholding as in the glass, the glory of Adoni are changed into the same image, into the same image from what? Glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, even as by the Ruach of Adoni, the Memphis of the Geta, of Egiziavihir. Now, what is so very interesting about this, you know, is, I mean, this is what well, we began off with just speaking about celebrating, you know, we wanted to know, you know, um, to the rest of our brothers and sisters is, are you planning to, to celebrate Adoni's Supper, you understand, this year, 2012? I think it's very, very important in the sabbatical, the Sabbath teaching, um, from Shemot even now to uh, Vayikra, it, it, it shows that whenever... Pesach, you understand? Know Whenever um, Passover was always um, celebrated, Fasica, what we know Ethiopically as Fasica, it was always celebrated at, at special turning points, at pivotal times in, in, the, in the history and experience of the Beit Israel. And this time, 2012, and the time, even the, the time of, of Jacob's trouble, and the times, what they, they say, the, the days of tribulation, that which we still are to go through, you understand, and our experience presently, you know, um, is, is such a turning point time. It reminds I of, of, of Amos, Amos 9 and 7. Amos 9 and 7 right here. Um, and to just to, to document, somebody want or need or would like the documentation about, so we're going back to Shimot, which was uh, the last Torah portion, um, Shimot, also known as the Hebrew book of, of Exodus, right? And we go into Exodus right here. Um, uh, it, it mentioned about, I think there's a note here about, uh, about the Exodus, and the first Pesach, the first um, Passover, there's a few notes here. We'll go through this perhaps in more detail. You understand? And the Pesach lamb, you know, so when you're speaking about the blessing of the bread, the blessing of the wine, and remember there's also the lamb. And the lamb's bread, you know, the lamb's bread is the kana, is the kana or the kana balsam or the cannabis. Which is, which is a biblical, a holy herb, but the knowledge of it and the true knowledge and the biblical knowledge of it, ones have been blinded, you know, the religious folks have been blinded, and they just think there goes those pot-smoking Rastafarians or there goes those marijuana smokers. They don't, they, they don't really understand the biblical. It's, no, it's not nothing new in a sense. You understand? But there's a, there's a biblical and there's a scriptural and prophetic foundation for it. So we'll find that section um, where it talked about here uh, about how um, Fasica uh, Passover was always celebrated at, at, at pivotal turning points. And I think that we as black folks, we as the once lost but now found Beta Israel, were living at such a, um, a, a pivotal turning point even in, in our story or in our our history in this in this present reality of everything that's 
you know, with everything that's, with all that's going on, this is a very pivotal time as, um, as well. Okay, we found this on page 152. 152. So it says uh, Exodus, Exodus 12 and 23 and 27, verse 27. Chapter 12, verse 23 and chapter 12, verse 27. They link the word Passover in the Hebrew um, Pesach, Pesach, or Bamarinya in the Afro-Shemitic, uh, Fasika in the royal Amharic, Fasika, to God's act to pass over, or to Pesach, or Pasach, Pasach. Um, the Israelites' houses in the plague of the firstborn, in the plague of the firstborn, in the Torah, or, or the the five books of Moses, the consolidated Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread, thus commemorate the Beta Israel liberation from Egypt. So we're in a time of the black liberation from the spiritual, you know, saying, Egypt, um, Mystery Babylon, et al. Exodus 1242, Exodus 2315, Exodus 34, 18, Numbers 33 and 3, Deuteronomy 16 and 1, uh, as well as verse 3 and verse 6. Now it says here that the Hebrew Bible uh, frequently notes the Israelites, the Beta Israel, Lawiyan, the Beta Israel, observance, ob observation of Passover at turning points at turning points in their story or in I and I history, in I and I mystery. Numbers 9, verses 1 to 5, it reports God's direction, John's direction to the Israelites to observe Passover in the wilderness of Sina, in the wilderness of, of Sinai. Remember about 40 or so years ago, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam announced and, and, and that we're in, we're in a, the wilderness of North America spoke about the wilderness of North America, and that reality is even more seemingly relevant now, overt and obvious now, than it might have been, you understand, than it might have been back then. But be that as it may, did we observe Fasica? We have not observed Fasica. I mean, certain of the black Hebrews and Ethiopian Hebrews and black Jews, yes, they have. But even I and I is elect Rastafari. May this even year be a turning point in the Rastafari observation of Fasika and I and I, I, and I Master's meal, Adoni's, Adoni's supper. Numbers 9, verse 1 to 5, reports John's direction to the Israelites to observe Passover in the wilderness of Sinai, of Sina, on the anniversary of their liberation from Egypt, Joshua 5. Verse 10 to 11 reports that upon entering the promised land, it says the Israelites kept the Passover on the plains of Jericho and ate unleavened cakes and parched corn. They ate produce of the land the next day. Second Kings chapter 23, verse 21 to 23 reports that King Josiah, commanded the Israelites to keep the Passover in Jerusalem as part of Josiah's reform when Josiah attempted a, a, a reformation, but also notes that the Israelites had not kept such a Passover from the days of the biblical judges, from the days of the, the Shoftim or, or, or the Mesophant, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel. Hmm and the kings of Judah, calling into question the observance of even kings David and Solomon. The more reverent Second Chronicles uh, chapter 8, verses 12 to verse 13, however, reports that Solomon offered sacrifices on the festivals, including the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yeah, keep uh, uh, Baal. This, uh, this, particular, this particular time coming up. So we have the six, which is, which is, which is Fasica, and then we have from the six to the 13, the seven days of the, of the unleavened, the unleavened uh, bread.
And Second Chronicles chapter 30, verses 1 to 27 reports King Hezekiah's observance of a second Passover anew. So, so even in the time of King um, Hezekiah, there was a, a observation of a second of a second type of Pesach, Pesach or Fasika anew in a new way, as sufficient numbers of neither the priests nor the people were prepared. Sounds like sounds like where we're at. Unfortunately, we're, not, there was not a sufficient number of priests or people prepared to do so before then. So before that time, many of the people were not prepared to do so. But in the time of uh, King Hezekiah, there was a second Passover anew. Now, Ezra, Ezra chapter 6, verse 19 to 22, it reports that the Beit Israel returned, that the Israelites returned from the Babylonian captivity and observed Passover. They ate the Passover lamb, or for us, the lamb's bread, and kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. Seven days with joy. So this is, the, this is some of the background or the foundation, you know, saying that we have to connect. Now, Amos 9 and, uh, Amos 9 and 7, Amos 9 and 7, it says right here, um, it's, and the whole context of this is so significant. Because most of us who focus on this, um, the final prophecy of the, of the dispersion and the ingathering and a particular Ethiopian connection have focused on Amos 9 and 7 to make that, that Ethiopia or that black true connection, again, to shine the light in the, in the um, religious and theological darkness concerning Ethiopia. It says, Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians to me, O children of Israel? So the Almighty God is saying to the children of Israel that you, to me, he's comparing the Israelites to the, his relationship with the Ethiopians. If you really understand the language and you understand the context of it, because the, the language of the scripture is very specific. If people would study the Bible like they study Shakespeare, you understand, they would probably get more out of it. And when they, they spend that much attention to this, the details and stop twisting it to their own um, misunderstandings, but really study it in its context. Because if you study the English language, it's saying, are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians to me? O children of Israel, it's almost like the children of Israel are, 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 is like the second set of children to the Most High and saying, but y'all are like the Ethiopians to me. So we can see that there's, yes, there's an obvious racial connection to both the Israelites being black people, being Ethiopian Hebrew people, being us, you understand, in this Western exile and, 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 and dispersion. Because look what he says furthermore. It says, saith the Lord, saith Yahweh, have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaphtor and the Syrians from Kerr? Behold, the eyes of the Lord God, the eyes of Adoni Yahweh, are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth. And I propose to you that a lot of these kind of signs that we're seeing, a lot of things that are going on, you know, especially in the, in, the, in the atmosphere and the elements, yes, part of it is, is the children of disobedience with their new toys, the harp. Some of these things that we see going on, of course, the chemtrails, so forth and so on. But there's a, there's a greater hand. That's, you see, that's a lesser hand, what you see men doing with, like, the heart project. That's a lesser hand, but there's a greater hand involved. And this is the hand that I and I speak for where it says, where it says that the eyes of, of Adoni Yahweh are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Yaakov, saith Yahweh. That's interesting. It says, for lo, I will command. Remember, this Torah portion, 
Um, this week leading into the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the RSS number 25 is known in the Hebrew as a Tzav or Tzav, Bamarinya in the Royal and Hark Bible, the Book of the Seven Seals of Hila Selassie is known as Izazacho, Izaz, Izaz, command or command them. But look what he says right here in verse 9, in 9-9, nine, nine, it says, For lo, I will command, and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. See, the true house of Israel according, you understand? According to the master, not according to a, a, a group of so-called Zionistic Jews or the Rothschilds, surrogates, or whoever, men and people and their conspiracy, whatever. But we're talking about the, you know, we're talking about the greater hand. According to the King of Kings and his Christ, according to Jah, according to God, he says that he will command and he will sift the house of Israel among all nations, among all nations, like as corn is sifted in the seas until... It says, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. Yet not the least grain. In other words, he's sifting us because he is seeking to find the grain, that which is, that which is truly his, that which is worthy. Like who is worthy? And so he's sifting it, you understand, but all the rubbish, you know, is going to be thrown out. And he explains that in the next verse, verse 10. It says, all the sinners of my people shall with his die with the sword which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. This is what you hear from the world today. You, you know what I mean? That no evil will come upon them. You, you know, forget about all the evil that's been done, all the bloodshed that's been done. No evil. They talk about American excellency. It's going to be number one forever. You'd be like, are these people... Um, psychologically disturbed. They talk about us. They say, oh, somebody's a religious nut. But, but, but when you look at these men and people, you understand, the sinners, even of, of my people, shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. But what is all of this about? And in a sense, why is the celebration of Adoni's Supper, you understand, of John Rastafari's Supper, you understand? Why is this so very important? Well, it tells us right here. It's about the restoration, you understand, of the Davidic monarchy, even the monarchy of the King of Kings. The future kingdom blessing is here. Adoni's return and the reestablishment of the Davidic monarchy. And Ethiopia, in this respect, is the key. Now, see, when you recognize what, what the Lord is saying right here, this is a rebuke to those... Um, you know, those black Hebrew Israelites who hate on Hila Selassie the first. You know, they may be I and I people. Remember what it says right here? It says, the sinners of my people, you understand, shall die by the sword. Those who speak um, blasphemy and error against the king of kings really need to understand. And we're talking about our people. Because otherwise, how do you explain the connection with the Davidic monarchy? You understand the reality. We're talking about reality. We're talking about evidence and facts as well as the connection of Jah's own word connecting the Israelites to the Ethiopians. This is why we don't get caught up with these foolish questions of unlearned people, you understand, or, you know, some um, Johnny comes zealously, you know what I mean, but don't got no knowledge, you understand, about the truth of Ketamawi Haile Selassie. So it says, in that day, will I rise or raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen? and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. So even in that connection, we have the true Zion, the true African Zion, the monarchy of Haile Selassie, the, 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 the imperial monarchy, in other words, of Ethiopia, you understand, the Judeo-Christian foundation thereof, and then the remnant of Edom, you understand, of Edom, the, 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 the Jewish converts, but not the ethnic Hebrews, because the Hebrews are Ethiopian or black peoples, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen. And of all the heathen, the other Goyim, 
which are called, what? Here's the key, which are called by my name. You know what I'm saying? And remember Revelation, a new name, Rastafari, is that new name. Saith the Lord that doeth this. You understand? Not the Lord that don't doeth this, but saith the Lord that doeth this. Saith Jah Rastafari in Revelation. You know, so full kingdom blessings are restored. It's Arayel. We are coming to a time of restoration and, and, and celebrating, you know, Pesah or Fasika, you know, saying, in and through the Moshiach. The black Messiah, who, who the Antichrist and, and men and people, you understand, have fought against, you understand, they can't overcome Jah. So just, they should be, just need to forget about it. You understand, it is, it's done. You understand, it's done. It says, full kingdom blessings, blessing of restored Israel. The last three verses right here. It says, behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that the plowman shall not overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste places and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruits of them. And I will plant them upon their land. And they shall go no more. And they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith Yahweh thy God. Now, amen, amen. This is a beautiful and important part of it. We didn't even read from the very top of it. But if you go to the top of the chapter, Amos 9, it also further connects with, with Christ's sacrifice, with the brazen altar, where the cross is a type of, you know, the mescal uh, is, is a type of the brazen altar. So we're speaking tabernacle here. You know what I'm saying? We're speaking the Old Testament pattern and the fulfillment in the black Messiah, in Yehoshua HaMoshiach. But at the top of the chapter, before we get to, are ye not as the children of Ethiopians, to me, O children of Israel, it says this. It says, I saw Adoni standing upon the altar, and he said, smite the lintel of the door, that the post may shake and cut them in the head all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, thence shall my hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence will I command the serpent, and he shall bite them. And though they go into captivity before their enemies, thence will I command the sword, and it shall slay them. And I will set mine eyes upon them for evil and not for good. And the Adoni Yahweh of hosts of the Sebaot is he that doeth, that, that toucheth the land, and it shall melt, and all that dwell therein shall mourn. And it shall rise up wholly like a flood, and shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven, and hath founded his troop in the earth. He that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth, Yahweh is his name. Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians to me, O children of Israel, saith Yahweh? Have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt, and the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Syrians from Ker? Behold, the eyes of Adoni Yahweh are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly 
destroy the house of Yaakov, saith Yahweh. For lo, I will command, and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. Like as corn is sifted in the sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say, The evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old, as in the days of the Kedem that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith Yahweh that doeth this. Behold, look and see, sight, here it is, the days come, saith Yahweh, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him that soweth seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them, and I will plant them upon their land and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith Yahweh, thy Elohim. Now the position of, we went through the whole thing, as you already probably know, um, but in the first, the first verse, it says, I saw Adoni standing upon the altar. And, he, and he's standing, he's standing, now in order to understand this, you have to recognize, well, what altar is he talking about? It's talking about the brazen altar. Saw him standing upon the altar. Now, they say that the cross, symbolically, the cross is synonymous with the altar because Christos was our sacrifice fulfilling the law of offerings. So we see Christos in the bullock or the ox sacrifice. We see Christos in the sheep or the lamb, the ram sacrifice. We see Christos as the goat. In other words, as the sinner's sacrifice, although he knew no sin. We see Christos as the turtle dove, as Jonah, because of the innocency. We see Christos as that pigeon, which is the poor man's, which is the poor man's sacrifice or the sacrifice of the poor. Now, the position of the Lord in the footnote right here, and they say Adonai, is significant. The altar speaks properly of mercy because of judgment executed upon an interposed sacrifice. Did you get that? Let me just read it one more time. It says that the altar, we're speaking about the brazen altar, the brass altar. Remember Christ has feet like brass, and we say, well, that explains Christ's humanity in that sense, his Ethiopianess or his blackness, when we recognize what brazen, what, what brass burns in the front of a fire looks like. But more, more than that, now let's take it to the higher level, the next higher level. It is symbolic of the brazen altar, you understand, and the altar speaks properly of mercy because of judgment executed upon an interposed, you understand, an interposed sacrifice, or we can say a superimposed sacrifice. But when altar and sacrifice are despised, right, when the altar and the sacrifice are despised, you know, when one despised the sacrifice of even Christ, you understand, what does it say? It says that the altar becomes a place of judgment. As I said, strike this, break this down right there, saying strike, you know, saying smite the lintel of the door and the post that, that, and, and, and that the post may shake and cut them in the head, all of them. And I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. So it then gives us a compare, a confer, CF dot, it says John 12, 31. Let's just go to John 12, 31, since we've 
begun to go through, you know, the fullness of this. Let's um, get the full idea and the full teaching, teaching forward. Of course, you probably have to, you know, study it on your own. You know, go over this on your own and just verify, you know, saying the truth of it for yourself. John 12, 31, here's what it says, John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. What? Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. What? Who is the prince of this world? See, we touched on that from 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, the God of this world. Who is the archon of this world? Now, notice the connection of this with this particular Passover week and what we've been speaking on right now leading up to um, to, to Passover or the Lord's Supper. And today is Wednesday, as we said before. You know, people talk about what day was Christ. Christ, they say, Good Friday. Well, if he died on Good Friday, who says he died on Good Friday? And then, how do you calculate Friday? From the Gentile West, white, white misunderstanding of Scripture, it was Wednesday, actually. You understand? It, it begins on the Wednesday. You see, and plus evening and morning is one day, so you really have to understand that. The whole thing about the timing, evening and morning, as we said um, with uh, that verse from um, when said the first day of the week. You understand? The first day of the week is, of course, Sunday. But it says it was even. If it was even, it's what we call over here, what we call over here, Saturday night. Saturday night is the evening of the first day, which is Sunday. But in the, in the white western Greenwich time, you know, because people are out of time. You know, people are get the wrong sense of the reality, have a Gentile world under understanding, and really don't understand in, in Christ's way, because here, this chapter is speaking about the supper at Beth Ani, at Beth Ani, right, with the woman and, um, with the woman and the ointment, then it's speaking about the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the, the Hosanna, or the Hosanna, blessed, is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of Adoni. Then there were there were there were Greeks, you understand, who would see Yeshua. You always, then there was Yeshua's answer, and here's the part of his answer where he says, The hour is come that the Son of Man, the Son of Adam, you know, interesting because Adam becomes like Osiris, Osar, and the son of Adam becomes like Horus or Cherui. If you if you can receive it, if you can kabbal it, Memphis Kedusin to Kabalu. And Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the son of Adam should be glorified. Verily, verily, you know the son of Adam should be celebrated. Because glory, honor, celebration in the root in the Hebrew, the Hebraic and the Afro Shemitic is basically one it comes down to one word. While in the English, these other words get connotations that kind of twist up your mind and they blind your mind to the, to the reality. So you need to go to the etymology. Verily, verily, I say to you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. That's, wow, that's deep. You, you, you got to meditate on this on your own time. He that loveth his life shall lose it, right? And he that hateth his life, get the context, in this world, right, in this world shall keep it to life eternal, to life eternal. If any man serve me, this is Yeshua speaking, Adoni is speaking. If any man serve I, let him follow I, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve I, him will my father honor, him will my father glorify, will my father celebrate. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, Abba, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I to, for this, for this cause came I to this hour. Abba, glorify thy name. 
glorify your name. Right? Glorify your name, Edomawi Haile Selassie, the first power of the triune. Then came there a voice from heaven, from the Shemaim, from the Samai, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. This is interesting. He says, I have what? I have both glorified and will glorify again from glory to glory. The people, therefore, that stood by heard it, said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. A melach spake to him. It's interesting, the whole thing about the thunder, you know, remember Exodus and, and, and the mountain and the commandment and the thunder. It says, Yeshua, Joshua answered and said, this voice came not because of I. It didn't come because of me, but for your sakes. Now, this is the key verse, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, if I and I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to I. This, say, this he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, we have heard out of the law, the Torah, that Christ abided forever, that Moshiach, abide, the Moshiach is eternal. And how sayest thou, the son of man, the son of Adam, must be lifted up? Who is this son of Adam? They didn't understand Harui. They didn't understand Haru. Yovas. Then Joshua said to them, Yet a little while in the light, in the illumination with you. Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have light. Least darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither. He goeth, while ye have light, while you have burhan, illumination, my men have amen in the illumination, in the burhan, have amen in the burhan, that ye may be as the children of the burhan. These things spake Joshua and departed, and did hide himself from them. Now, it's interesting because where it says now is the judgment. Now, notice how this connects with, with, with uh, Amos 9 and 1, where in Amos 9 and 1 is telling us the position, the position of the Lord. I saw Adoni standing upon the altar. Adoni was standing upon the altar. The altar speaks properly of mercy because of judgment executed upon an interposed sacrifice. But when the altar and sacrifice, when the cross and Christ, in other words, is despised, the altar becomes a place of judgment. And then John 12, John 12, 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. They should have asked, who is this prince of the world that you're casting out? Maybe they understood who the prince of this world was. But now, what's interesting is, is the, footnote, the footnote link, it says, the seven judgments of Yeshua HaMoshiach bearing witness as bearing the Mitmanon sins, the sins of the Amanya, the Mitmanon, the faithful, have been judged in the person of Joshua HaMoshiach, Jesus Christos, lifted up on the cross. The result was death for Moshiach, was death for Joshua, and justification for the Amanya, for the, the faithful, who can never again be put in jeopardy, who can never again be put in jeopardy. And then it gives us many good scriptural verses and then other judgments, but it's Interesting that it gives us this link right here to um, the seven, the seven judgments. Remind me of the if seven seals, of course, the seven, the seven trumpets, 
and then we have the seven vows, and we're entering into now uh, the time of the seven, the seven judgments or those, those seven um, vows, you know, those seven vows in 2012, 2012, 2012. Want to come, <laughs> y'all willing, all right? Uh, salam, laku alaykum. Salam, le nante yuhum. Shalom. And once again, are you going to celebrate Adoni supper in spirit and in truth with I and I? Stay tuned. Y'all will in the vid coming forward, touching on some of the some of the keys and some of the particulars. Shalom.